before I left for my long jaunt abroad, we were in the middle of a series working through the Lord's Prayer as it reveals, or as it's revealed in Matthew chapter 6. And so we'd gone through the first few petitions and we were up to the petition referenced in verse 12, which we're going to take a look at tonight that speaks to forgiveness. And so we're going to delve into that a little bit tonight and, uh, and read on that and ask God to speak to our hearts about forgiveness And then we're going to spend some time later on together in prayer. Colby, I feel like I'm probably a bit too loud. Thank you. All right, so we're going to turn to Matthew 6. And as we're turning there, let's go to the Lord indeed to kick off our time together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you that you are a forgiving God. You're a merciful God. Lord, I thank you that you have a uh, a fully and perfect view of all of our corruption and our sin and our trespass, and yet you forgive freely. You forgive lovingly and mercifully, God. We give you great thanks for that. We pray tonight as we look at this topic of forgiveness that we would enlarge our thinking and our estimation of how gracious you are. And also, Lord God, in in keeping with that, you help us to, to enlarge our own thinking of how merciful your gospel calls us to be in response to your forgiveness of us. So we pray your blessing tonight, God, as we, as we move through this passage of Scripture, and we ask you to bless it to our hearts, and may it bear fruit in our lives, and above all else, that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So Matthew 6, uh, we're going to read the entire prayer, as we have done each time we've gathered to, to speak on this. So verse 9, uh, down to verse 12, it's, it's a short prayer, but it is a model prayer that Christ gave. I think it was the first night we spoke on this, I had actually said that the reality is uh, very, few people, very few people are convinced Jesus gave this uh, as a prayer that ought to be prayed verbatim. Now, if you do that, if that's part of your devotional practice, that's fine. In fact, that's a, that's a noble thing to do, a noble habit. But more likely than not, Jesus gave this as a, as a model prayer, as a way to think about the way that we pray. So we've been taking each petition on its own uh, and looking at it deeply and understanding how God would have that affect the way we pray and the way we think about the gospel and uh, and God saving us in Christ. So the prayer kicks off in verse 9 and it goes like this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now with that in mind, just that simple petition, we're going to zero in on that. We're going to turn, keeping in Matthew's gospel, to chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. Jesus shares a parable. And the parable speaks precisely to this concept that it wouldn't have escaped your attention as we saw that uh, petition in verse 12. The reference to what we know is sin, what we know as corruption or our our inability to keep the law, it's spoken of as debt. It's a, it's a debt. That's a common way in which the New Testament speaks of sin as a debt, as something that we owe, something that we lack, some, some deficiency in us that we, we owe the holy justice of God and the holy character of God. We are in His debt. So picking up at Matthew 18, we're going to read this account. And it starts, off with, uh, it starts off with the Apostle Peter coming up to Jesus and trying to impress the Lord. Now, you've read the Gospels. You know that whenever Peter does this, it always ends really badly for him. And it's going to end really badly for him in this account as well. He's going to, he's going to run up to Jesus and he's going to speak to Jesus about just how, just how merciful he is as a person. And the, uh, the underlying context here is that there is a rabbinic tradition, a strong tradition in the time of Jesus Christ that it was assumed and taught and imbibed that you had an obligation to forgive your brother three times, three times. Times, If the same person comes to you on three separate occasions and sins against you, you're obliged to forgive that brother three times. So keeping that in mind, now as we go to the text, think about Peter's approach to Christ to win brownie points with the boss, to curry favor with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 of Matthew 18, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? as many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, 
but 77 times. In fact, some manuscripts will, will embellish this further and say 70 times 7 times. So as, as, as Peter comes and wants to show his, the depth of his mercy and benevolence and empathy for sinners, Jesus says that the forgiveness that we ought to be ready and willing to offer others ought to be limitless. Why? Because it reflects God's forgiveness of us. As we read in the petition, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. Verse 23 of Matthew 18, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle one, it was, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. When the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they, they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, Jesus closes the parable with this summary. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is fairly staggering. If you were in the original audience as Jesus was speaking like this, maybe one of the, one of the disciples or, or maybe the, the broader congregation of people that had gathered to hear Jesus speak, there is so much contained in this parable that would be jaw-dropping to you would be you would be completely flummoxed at the things you would hear. Firstly, Jesus completely overriding the rabbinic tradition of his day by saying that our forgiveness of others should not be limited. And then to begin to share the story and to demonstrate, this is really the, the crux of this entire parable, is that we would understand that our willingness to forgive others should always stem from God's free and willing forgiveness of us. So Peter approaches, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Is it, is it seven times? Maybe Peter was hoping Jesus would be impressed. Maybe Peter was hoping Jesus would say, well, wow, Peter, that's, that's staggering. I mean, good for you, Peter. I was going to maintain the rabbinic tradition, but, but look at you. Everybody marvel at Peter. What, what great empathy and mercy he has shown. But Jesus said, I don't teach that. That's not, that's not part of the gospel I have brought. I teach it's 70 77, or even 70 times 7. As we go to this parable and we look to understand it, we get a lot of insight into this petition of the prayer. Forgive us, Lord, of our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. Let's go back to Matthew 18 and work our way through some of, these, some of the truths of this parable. Firstly, we see in verse 23, and perhaps uh, more important than anything, anything else, this is, a, this is a parable of the kingdom. This is about the kingdom of God. This is not about the kingdom of men or the way that rulers settle accounts. This is, this is about the Lord. We see in verse 24, the parable starts out with the, with the scene being set that this king began to settle accounts. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. The first thing we should know, and sometimes I wonder whether, whether people have really, really got a sense of this, is that God will always settle accounts. There will never be, under God's glorious sovereign reign, an account that's delinquent or not settled. In fact, it's, 
It's important that we continually maintain this concept that every single debt, and if we want to use the more, uh, the more overarching word for this, every sin that's ever committed under God's sovereign reign will be satisfied. Either satisfied in the, in the ruin of the sinner's eternal punishment in hell or satisfied at the perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross. There will not be any accounts not satisfied. God is a just, a holy, omniscient and omnipotent judge. So just like in the parable, the king wants to settle accounts, so the Lord will call all to give an account. We should, we should see ourselves in this story from the first verse and realize that God is a just God. God is calling us to be ready for the day in which he settles accounts with us. A servant is brought in. And the servant, we're told, owes an incredible amount of money. 10,000 talents. I remember many years ago when I first uh, was teaching on this particular parable. Many, many years ago, in fact. And I'd always read this parable and come across this amount, 10,000 talents. And, and I always read it as in like, just an obscene amount of money, and that was true. And then I began to kind of pour into the, the original language and take a look at what this, what this currency value would have been like in the day, and I realized when you convert it to our, our modern economic value, you're looking at about $6 billion. $6 billion. This is, this is the kind of money that would float the Roman Empire. So if you're, if you're part of that original audience of Jesus and he's telling his parable and there's a servant who owes 10,000 10, talents, you would begin to think, how does anybody get in that kind of debt? That is an unthinkable amount of debt. What we see is the first thing we notice in the parable is the king says to the servant, the master says, I'm going to throw you, your wife, and your children in prison until you pay it all. What, is, what does this component of the parable show us? It shows us that the law must always do its work first. This is a truth throughout all of Scripture. This is the way we understand the gospel comes on the back of the condemnation of the law. We just started a brand new series in our Sunday morning service in the book of Galatians. And, and Paul will use it in an incredibly helpful ideal with regards to the law. He will call the law a schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. This is what the law does first. Before you can truly appreciate and embrace the gospel of Jesus, the good news, you first have to hear the condemnation of Sinai, the, the thundering of your guilt of sin. To use the words of the the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, he used to say it like this. He used to say that the, the law is the, it's the needle which needs to first penetrate to drag with it the silken thread of the gospel. You see it right here in the parable. You see that this particular debtor that owes no less than $6 billion, since he could not pay, verse 25, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Don't think, don't think as we read that, that there has been somehow a, a departure from Jesus, obviously in the parable, the master of the king, if it wasn't plain to you, that represents God in his justice and his judgment. And don't think for a moment that somehow there's been a departure from that imagery. This is, this is what God does. Through the law, he announces our condemnation. He announces our debt. He reveals to us that we're not good enough. We're not holy enough. We're, we're not in the right place in our natural state to just walk on into heaven and assume all the luxuries and the privileges of the kingdom. We are in fact dead in trespasses and sins. The law condemns. The debtor pleads for forgiveness. And the king in the parable does the unthinkable. He does way more than what's requested. If you, go, if you go to the parable with me, we'll see it right here in the text. Verse 26, the servant fell on his knees, imploring, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. Have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. That's what the request is. The king, the master does unthinkably more than that. He cancels the debt entirely. 
Now, if you were, if you were, if you were there hearing Jesus teach this, at that point, you might just mentally check out. Just, no. <laughs> that, no, there's no way that could ever happen, would ever happen. That's unfathomable. That's unreasonable. I don't believe that. The debtor said to the king, be merciful and give me a chance to pay it off. And that would have been mercy. There are plenty of ways this king could have been merciful. He could have said to the guy, well, you owe this debt. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some time to pay it off. And and in that time while you're paying it off, I'm still going to sell your wife and your kids. That would have been a perfectly legal way under Roman law to handle that debt. The king could have done that. The king could have said, I'm going to give you time and space to to recoup this money and, and pay me off. But I'm going to sell your family. Or I'm going to enslave you until you can pay it off. There are, there are a thousand increments of mercy that this king could have shown, but in the end, he completely cancels the debt. If that's not stunning enough, I mean, every, every verse just elevates the staggering nature of this story. This particular debtor, while his outward circumstance has radically changed, his heart is not changed. He is not changed. So we see this in verse 28. We see this where it says, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So to give you the currency value of that, the, the exchange on that, that's about three months wage. We went from $6 billion to about three months of a laborer's wage. Maybe, maybe a few thousand dollars. And, and, and the debtor goes out and finds someone that owes him this amount of money. He seizes him, begins to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and, and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. The outward circumstance had changed, but his heart was not changed. This is staggering. And in fact, this is why the the Lord's Prayer words the petition the way it does. Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. This is the nature of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not only an outward declaration of freedom, in Christ, or debt forgiven in Christ. The gospel is the power of God to actually work a true change in our hearts to not only save us, but to conform us to the image and example of Christ. And if the gospel is not changing us, then the gospel is not in any real way our possession. That's what this debtor in the story is actually trying to demonstrate. While up until, up until the point where he walks out of the king's chamber and finds someone who owes him money and he starts to choke him and throws him in prison until he pays the last amount, all and sundry until that point, he looked like just any old other believer. But the sign of a changed heart is the ability to pass on the gracious mercy that God has bestowed on you. So we see this in verse 34 and verse 35. At this point, the debtor is called in back before the king. The king's heard about his behavior. It says in verse 34 and 35, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, Jesus said, now we've, we've burst out of the parable into a teaching moment. So also, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Can't even fathom how this story could have been possibly comprehensible to that original audience. Every stage, every, every verse, every extra layer of complexity, complexity added to this parable would have been staggering. But the reality is we see this repeated countless times every day. The petition in the Lord's Prayer is to ask for forgiveness. That's important. And it's also important we realize that the way the petition is framed, we should be praying it 
every day. Every day. In fact, the, the very previous petition says, Lord, give us this day, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. We as believers are in daily need of God's mercy, the bestowal of God's grace and the forgiveness of our sins every day. That's what we need. But if that outward circumstance, or at least that perceived outward circumstance, hasn't in fact changed our hearts, affected our inner being, then we are not truly forgiven. So also, Jesus said, so also will the Heavenly Father do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. What's staggering about all this is when we think about the nature of sin, because we're really not talking about a pecuniary debt right now. We're talking in the parable and in the prayer about actual sin. That one sin, one sin that, 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 that you or I may have committed today or, or, or even this week, one sin is of an unfathomable and incalculable debt, even more than Six billion dollars. In fact, the scripture is very straightforward on this. The scripture tells us that through one transgression, death entered our race, humanity, and condemnation for all. The Bible tells us that every sin has enough heinousness and wickedness in it to condemn the human heart forever. The Bible tells us that, that such is the debt of even a, even a single sin, that, that, that if you could find that perfect person that lived that perfect life, never once stepping outside the narrow bounds of God's moral perfection all of their life, but, but moments before they died their natural death, they committed one small indiscretion, that person, without obtaining forgiveness, would still be condemned. The scripture is very clear. The soul that sins shall surely die. For the wages of sin is death. Just one of our sins. In the sight of God and in the light of God's holiness and His glorious perfection is worth infinitely more than six billion dollars. There's no wonder then that in the, in the course of the parable, Jesus was attempting to give a, a sense of the, the magnitude, the, the magnitude of what our debt to God is. Now, of course, as you think through the parable, the way this should have played out is fairly straightforward. The, the, the debtor should have come before the king and, and been announced that you, you owe this amount of money. You're going to be sold with your wife and your kids and, and the king's going to try and recoup some of that, that debt and then the debtor pleads for more time. And could you imagine standing there and owing that obscene amount of money and then the king just says, you know what, I'm in a good mood. I'm just going to cancel the debt entirely. I mean, $6 billion forgiven is six billion dollars earned? Could you, could, I mean, I don't think anyone in this room's ever in one single glance been able to cast their eyes over six billion dollars. Could you, could you imagine in a moment suddenly being granted that kind of a gift? Could you imagine how you'd feel? Could you imagine how you would respond? Could you, could you imagine finding out that you've just come into that kind of a sum of money? Imagine how you'd feel. I'm sure right now you're trying to imagine how you would feel. <laughs> what, what would I even think? How, how could I even respond? I'd, I'd almost be just comatose with trying to, my brain just, just whizzing, trying to comprehend six billion dollars. It's crazy. It's utterly crazy. And then think about that. Let's, let's, let, let's kind of play out this scenario. You, you've just come into that kind of wealth instantaneously, can I, can I ask you, would you be in a good mood? Would that depress you? Would you be irascible? Would you be irritable? Would you be somehow frustrated? This, this guy comes before the king owing $6 billion. The king doesn't even grant his request for more time. The king just says, debt canceled, free to go, have a great life. The guy leaves the chamber of the king his eyes land upon another servant that owes him a couple of months' wage, something that is incomparable to the ultimate debt that he owed. 
And he's immediately angry. Do you, do you see the baffling nature of this? Do, the stunning nature. Of, this, is, this is what's revealing about this debtor's heart, about, about his predisposition. He, he finds that, that other guy that owes him a small a sum by comparison and begins to choke him and, and has him thrown in prison. And all that to say the, the ridiculous nature of this, even as we begin to think about that. Could you, could you imagine suddenly coming into $6 billion worth of value and worth and, and currency and could you imagine what possibly could upset you after that? I mean, would you be that concerned with a flat tire? Would you be, would you be that bothered with the maintenance cost or the, the, the rent going up or the bills pouring in your, your mailbox? I mean, what really could give you a bad day after you've realized you've just earned $6 billion? All that to say, that's exactly Jesus' point in the gospel is that if we are recipients of something even better than that large, obscene sum of money, if we are recipients of something even greater, something more eternal, a kingdom that can never be shaken, an inheritance, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what you stand to inherit in the kingdom of God and you did nothing to earn it. Free gift of God. You came as a sinner to the banquet of the Lord. You said, I have nothing to pay. I have nothing to give. I have nothing to offer. God, can you be merciful to me, a sinner? And God said, in the blink of an eye, all your debt is canceled. You have now an eternity, an infinite amount of riches, glory, and prominence in the kingdom of God. And then what do we do? Oh, we know what we do. We, <laughs> we're driving out of the parking lot of church and someone cuts us off. Right? We're this guy so many times. We hold grudges. We keep offenses. We store up petty, petty things about other people. We don't do it intentionally. I mean, we're Christian, right? But in our hearts, we allow offenses to poison us. What did that person say? What did that person do? Well, they'll, they'll get theirs. They'll get paid back. What goes around comes around. Every time we stand under the preaching of the gospel and we hear again just what God has done for us, that every single sin we've ever committed, now commit, or will yet commit throughout our life, every single sin is of a greater debt than $6 billion. And God has freely, finally, fully forgiven it all in the death of Christ at the cross. I wonder why, as Christians, I own up to this just like any other of us should, why our joy is so easily robbed from us? Why, why is our peace and contentment in Christ so easily stifled? Why, why does the world have such a hook on us? Why do other people's behavior, and, and maybe, maybe they truly were treating us in a bad way, maybe we genuinely were wronged? Can I let you in on a, a little bit of a, some pastoral insight here? I've been preaching the gospel for a, a long time. In fact, come September will mark my 20th year preaching the gospel. Every single time, so I'm saying this, hoping this doesn't happen tonight, but every single time I've ever spoken about this very concept, that God in His lavish mercy forgives us of all of our debt, all of our sin, all of our corruption through the one sacrifice of Christ and calls us to be merciful calls us to not only pray, Lord, forgive me my debts, but empower me, help me to forgive others. Every single time I've ever preached on this, without failure, I've had someone come to me after that sermon and say, Craig, you do not know what that person did to me. Everything you've said, Craig, is great for everybody else, but I'm the exception because you just don't know how poorly I've been mistreated. You don't know how badly I've been abused.
In fact, I remember one time, some years back, preaching exactly this. And I said exactly what I just said, that every time I've ever preached this, I've had someone bail me up after the service and say that, thinking this will preserve me ever having to experience that again. And a dear woman, I was out getting, a, getting some water after the service, not this church, a church back in Australia. She comes up next to me and she goes, I get your point, but truly you don't know what happened to me and I will not be forgiving that person. And at every time you get that sense from that person that they feel like if they could, if they could just run you through the list of abuses that they've endured, then in some way, shape or form, I would join them in saying this verse doesn't apply to them. But the reality is, the reason why we think that, and we all in some way, shape, or form, we, we harbor that suspicion about abuses that have occurred to us and people that have mistreated us and the way that others have gone ahead and, 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 and treated us so spitefully and, and deceitfully and whatever else, we feel like we kind of have the monopoly on holding it against them. We don't have to forgive them. And the reason why we do that, it's not... It's not because we don't know how much other people have been abused. It's not because the reality is the abuse we've suffered truly is that bad. Ultimately, I want you to hear this very well this evening. It's because we fail to realize what every one of our sins is what an infinite abuse it is to God. We fail to realize the grand point of this parable, the grand point of this parable has to be seen in the contrast between 10,000 talents and 100 denarii. No matter what we experience in this life, in this world, and I can assure you, having preached the gospel for as long as I have and counseled many thousands of people that have gone through the most horrific abuses, the things that even me as a counselor prevented me from sleeping for nights on end, having to listen to the graphic stories of people abused. The truth of this is not to undermine pain, but it is to demonstrate the reality that every sin we commit is a grave abuse and an assault on the infinite majesty of a holy God. And the good news is that God has sent forth His Son. And where we see this most explicitly and most vividly is God hates sin so much. Sin abuses and assaults God so much. Sin is cosmic treason to the sovereign of the universe to a degree to which we sinners have never even begun to fathom. But the clearest place we get a vivid imagery of this is the cross of Jesus Christ. Where we can always just simply know that whether we truly understand the nature of sin or we're constantly downplaying it because of our, because of our inward bias, we, after all, we're, we're sinners, right? But we see at the cross that God loves His own Son with an infinite love. God loves Jesus with an unchanging love. But God hates sin so much that when the sin of God's people is imputed to the person of Christ at the cross, God explodes his wrath against Jesus, condemns and destroys him there. This is the nature of God's justice against sin. And this is the reason for which forgiveness can be freely and fully granted all of us. So we pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. If you just... If you take nothing else away from this tonight, but, but think this through, that every single sin any one of us ever commits infinitely outweighs even $6 billion. Do you realize that? Do you realize that if you'd only ever committed one sin and you stood before the very bar of God in heaven and he said, you're guilty of this one sin and you said, Lord, I knew you'd bring it up. I understand you're perfect. You've got a book of remembrance. I knew this was coming up. I've brought with me six billion US dollars. I just want to pay that sin off. I want, to, I want to cover that debt right now. The Lord would say, I will take your six billion dollars and still you will go to a prison called hell forever. Such is the depravity of sin. Forgive us our debts. So we also have forgiven our debtors because God has paid it all. Paid it all once for all 
in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross. This free offer for all humanity, that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Because Jesus in his perfect living, his vicarious dying, his triumphant rising has paid all our debts. And those whom the gospel truly changes their hearts, those who have in fact actually received this infinite gift of forgiveness, are quick and free to forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Would you bow your head with me and close your eyes as we go to the Lord with a word of prayer this evening? Father, we do thank you so much for this truth of Scripture, this, Father, to be honest, this often unpalatable truth. Father, it's passages like this which, which really force us to begin, to begin to start to think about what our debt toward you truly is. And Father, it's an unpleasant thought. It's an important thought, but it's unpalatable. It's, it, it's difficult. It's, it's burdensome for us to think about this. Many of us haven't even gone through today without some form of sin in our life, some sin of our attitude or sin of our heart or whatever it may be. God, sin of our lips or, or sin of action. God, this is, this is who we are. We, we are people that are just continually afflicted by the Adamic nature and tempted into sin by our adversary and the world around us. But God, we love this gospel. We love this gospel of Jesus. This freedom that shows us that Jesus came and paid it all. That he's paid the debt. He has canceled the debt. If we come to you, Father, like the, like the debtor in the parable, and we said, Father, just give us more time. We will, we'll earn off the debt that our sins incurred. We'll, we'll, we'll work it off. Father, we would go to hell forever. We could never, ever do enough, pay enough, be good enough to cancel the debt of a single sin. But we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus was good enough, holy, harmless, undefiled, like us in every way except without sin. And he went to that cross and shed his infinitely precious and valuable blood to wash away all our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to forgive us all of our debts, and Father, you call us to allow this gospel not only to be external and objective good news, but to be inward, life-changing, heart-affecting, forgiveness-giving good news. Lord, you call us to not only ask you for forgiveness, but that you would give us grace to forgive others as well. Father, there are people here tonight who have gone through unspeakable abuse unspeakable amounts of abuse. Father, you know it all. I, I don't know it all. Even this group of people here tonight, we don't know each other's past. We don't know our, each other's background. We don't know it that well to be able to understand how much others may have attacked and assailed and done great ruin to us. But Father, the great message of this parable is that no matter how much others have abused us and attacked us and, and, and hated us, it's nothing in comparison so what even one of our sins is an assault on you. But God, you freely forgive. And your message to us tonight is that, that we would be true recipients of your forgiveness. We must show this change of heart by freely forgiving others as well. Help us to pray this prayer with a true depth of, of sincerity. Forgive us our debts, God, every one of us. Help us see that Jesus was good enough, holy enough, died on that cross pure and shed his blood to save us. He rose again to secure us and he calls us to act out a life of obedience after his example. We pray you bless this word to us. Bless our time together in prayer tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.